BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello. Almost 15 centuries ago, Antara ibn Shaddad was fighting on the Arabian Peninsula and composing poems he hoped would long outlast him, and they have. He stands out not only for his military excellence, but for his story. He was born to an Ethiopian slave and a powerful knight, and was himself a slave until he won his freedom in battle. When Islam arrived later and the Arabic language spread, he became famous as the great warrior poet, a model for others and the inspiration for the mighty epic of Antar and Abla, which is still being recited today. With me to discuss the poetry of Antar ibn Shaddad are James Montgomery, Sir Thomas Adams, Professor of Arabic at the University of Cambridge, Marley Hammond, Senior Lecturer in Arabic Popular Literature and Culture at SOAS, University of London, and Harry Munt, a Lecturer in Medieval History at the University of York. James Montgomery, let's separate the myth from the history. What do we know about the man himself? Antar ibn Shaddad was a character who created an enormous legend around himself. It's very difficult to untangle the legend from the historical figure, but most versions of the legend converge around certain key points. So we know that he lived roughly around 600 AD, that he lived in Arabia, in a region called Najd, which is the highland plateau, uh, sort of 100 miles northwest of Riyadh in modern Saudi Arabia, that he was a poet, that he was a warrior, that he was black and born to a slave mother, which meant that he himself was a slave. And beyond that, it's very difficult to say anything with um, uh, any conviction. But what is said about him with a great deal of conviction by a lot of people ever since? Uh, It's said that he was the mightiest warrior, uh, possibly that uh, uh, Islam... Uh, and Arabic uh, civilization has ever encountered, that he was one of its greatest poets, that um, his quest for recognition uh, and the his attempt to win his freedom uh, in battle uh, became the stuff of uh, stories around campfires uh, and persisted for centuries afterwards. Given it was an oral culture, legends can often carry real stories forward. Yes, for- indeed. Yes. A very long time. Yeah. How much credence to give, do you give to what you've just said? Um, I think it's the best uh, version of events that accounts for the literary remains that we have uh, in, in, in front of us today. We talk about him being a warrior, and an elite warrior. What does that mean? Yeah, so an elite warrior in this time would, uh, in Antara's case in specific, in, uh, would be a northern Arab cavalryman, so horseback warfare is what we're talking about. Uh, These uh, warriors specialised in uh, raiding at dawn uh, and so they would um, travel through the night to the tribe they were about to raid. They would wait for dawn uh, and raid first thing in the morning. So in order to do that you needed certain pieces of equipment and those pieces of equipment were expensive and not available to everyone. So for a start you needed a horse obviously and a very good horse but you also needed a camel because the horse was taken alongside the camel uh, it, across the desert to um, not tire the horse out before combat the following morning. <clears throat> you needed body armour, and that would comprise a helmet. Uh, it would comprise a coat of mail, either of a tunic length to about the knee or to foot length, uh, and that would be made of um, uh, pieces of uh, iron welded and, and nailed together. You needed a sword, a shield, a lance, probably made with bamboo imported from India, Um, a spear, short spear, what sometimes is referred to as an assegai for hand-to-hand combat, a dagger, possibly a bow and arrow, Uh, and your horse may also have been uh, fitted with some bits of armour. So that's a fairly expensive set of kit that um, uh, means that not everyone uh, could afford it. Um, and that um, only those who were uh, uh, the tribal elite would have access to such accoutrements. What were the swords like? The swords? So there were two types of swords. 
One uh, which is referred to in the sources as a Yemeni sword. So that's a long blade sword, straight blade, probably ridged in the middle. Um, and then there's an Indian sword, which is probably curved. Um, <clears throat> and those were the two particular um, swords that the hunter, as poetry mentions, regularly. So they come out of the night and attack another tribe. We'll uh, maybe talk about those attacks a little later. Marnie Hammond, what was the... Let's talk about him as a poet. We know... We, who, and he adopted the poetry form of the Qasida. What was that and why was it important? Right. So Qasida in modern Arabic simply means poem. But when we're talking about classical Arabic poetry... It can mean either a poem of a certain length written in a certain meter and with mono rhyme, or it can mean something very specific. So um, scholars of Arabic literature talk about the Qasida as um, a model or a paradigm. I like to think of it as a narrative paradigm where the poetic persona begins by contemplating for there are different conventions that begin the Qasida, it's called the Nasib, and one convention is um, contemplating the abandoned campsite of the beloved. And another convention is watching the departing women folk of the tribe. And another convention is having the phantom of the beloved come and visit the poetic persona at night. So this is um, what's usually called an amatory or um, nostalgic prelude. And then the poetic persona kind of disengages from the beloved in something called the tachallus, which means to be free of or to, to get rid of something. So um, in the tachallus, the poetic persona says, forget about her, forget about the beloved, and let's move on. And then there's usually a section including the description of a camel, and um, sometimes the poetic persona is astride a camel or a horse. And in what we call the journey section, the poetic persona would seem to be going somewhere <laughs> in space and time. And then we arrive at the purpose of the poem, the gharad, which may be um, panegyric, it may be self-praise, it may be invective, it could be any theme or genre, really. So the Qasida is actually, it's very rare to find a poem that fits this description to a T, but a lot of poems seem to be engaged in a kind of dialogue with the form. And he was supposed to be very uh, skillful at this, and his themes were mainly war and honor. Um, what was the status of those who, com who could compose poetry as well as fight. If you were a great fighter, do you feel you had to be a poet and, as well? I don't know that you would have to be a great poet if you were a great fighter. <laughs> what I think I can talk about is the hierarchies of poets. So, I mean, sometimes a poet was known specifically for being a warrior, like Antara in the, um, in the book Fuhulat Ashura. He's asked um, the the Al Asma'i, who's basically the author of the book, is asked, Is Antara a stallion poet, a fah? And the most esteemed poets were called stallions. And he said, He is the greatest, Ash'ar al Fursan, he is the greatest of the warrior poets. Wasn't it important for, as I've read in the notes that you three have supplied, so yes. uh, wasn't it important? Or didn't elite troop, elite people, or warriors anyway, think that they had to memorialize their life in poetry so as to be famous forever, known forever and ever, which yes. Tara certainly is. This is an important fact. Killing people in battle was one thing, and doing and making yourself immortal through verse was another. Yes. Yeah, I think <laughs> Good. so. Good. <laughs> well, we've sorted that out then. <laughs> right. <laughs> Harry Munt, it's thought that he was living in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula. Can you describe what that place was like then? Yeah, so the middle of the Arabian Peninsula is uh, perhaps the part of the, of the peninsula that most uh, resembles the popular perception of Arabia, a, sort of a, a desert steppe plateau that extends from the centre of what's now Saudi Arabia to the north, uh, to the borderlands in modern Jordan, Syria and Iraq. A reasonably, uh, so a fairly dry place without rainfall, and um, 
and the, and the kind of lifestyles of the inhabitants that go alongside that. To the west of this area, however, it gets quite different, and Antara's activities uh, sort of border from Nejd in Central Arabia uh, out towards a region called the Hejaz uh, in Western Arabia that contains the, uh, the cities of Mecca and Medina. Um, and that's a more mountainous region, and it has these uh, alongside the mountains and these um, sort of extinct volcanic uh, Lava fields. He was before Me- Mecca and Medina, so let's try to stick to. He was pre-Islamic. That's the sort of main, main one of the main points. Um, when you say you talk about that, was it mainly nomadic? Were there very few settlements? What was going on? Were there small tribes? If so, how small? How big were the tribes? So, so the society was uh, principally. Uh, at least what's come down, organised tribally. So tribes are very important, but tribes don't necessarily mean nomadic. Uh, there would have been settlements around places where water was available and settled activity, settled agricultural activity. And then there were also uh, various um, scales of nomadism, if you like. So from sort of some fully nomadic groups who would spend all year moving around different territories to find pasture land for their, for their animals. But then also groups that are somewhere in between and uh, might move at particular seasons, uh, so spend the winter season in one place, the summer season in another place, and also undertake maybe some agricultural activities alongside animal raising as well. When we talk about battles, are we talking about tribal battles, basically? So we are often talking about tribal battles, and yeah. how many men would be involved? I think they were probably quite small, I suspect, so that we're not, we're not really talking very, la- very large numbers. Oh, a few hundred maybe on each side. I suspect it would have been on that kind of level. I don't, we're, we're not talking enormous armies here uh, fighting each other, but sort of raiding of these smaller tribal groups. And which were the great powers around this region? So there were three powers that really uh, surrounded this region and tried to exert influence at the time of Antara's uh, roughly the time of Antara's life. So in the northwest, you had the Roman Empire um, uh, extending its power southwards into the Arabian Peninsula. To the northeast, you had the Sasanian Persian Empire that was also trying to control its borderlands along the uh, along the Arabian Peninsula. And then in the southwest of the peninsula, roughly in what's today Yemen, there was also uh, a kingdom called the Himyarite Kingdom that over the uh, fifth and sixth century, so in getting into Antara's lifetime, was trying to expand its own power over that Central Arabian uh, step as well. So, did his let's call it his area, presuming he was alive and there and then when we said he was, uh, did they feel threatened by these powers? Did these powers threaten them or just leave them alone? No, they did get involved to a certain extent. So, um, most of these group, most of these empires and powers around the edges, they try to make use of some of the inhabitants of Arabia to extend to expand their own power into Arabia. So, uh, a group from the tribe of Ghassan were used by the Roman Empire in the 6th century to try and expand their power. Uh, a group from the tribe of Lach uh, tried to do the same for the Persians. So in that, in that sense, these, uh, these imperial powers did try and expand influence among the tribes in Arabia. But do we, do we have an idea then of constant disturbance, constant tribal warfare, almost unceasing warfare, one way or another? That does, that, I suppose that is an image that comes out of quite a lot of the poetry. Um, I'm not sure it's... Uh, and there is a lot, of, a lot of tribal raiding is talked about in some of the other mm. sources as well. So, I mean, that is certainly an image that can be presented. Thank you very much. James Montgomery, assuming he was there and assuming the per- poems are his, which people have done for nearly 1,500 years now, um, and you've just tr- well translated them, and I must say I've enjoyed them enormously. Oh, thank you. Really. Um, and you've translated one called Did Poetry Die? Yes. Now, could you tell us about that and quote a little from it, please? Of course. In English, if you... If you or in both, I don't mind. So we, we can do it in both. Well, let's do it in both. That'll be a bit of fun. Uh, so... <coughs> uh, just by way of, of, of preface, this uh, is Antara's most celebrated poem. It is. Um, it was one of a number of poems referred to as Mu'allaqat, and that is a word that uh, is thought to represent poems that were uh, considered to be the prize poems uh, of a particular year or a particular season were then written on cloth and suspended from the walls of the pre-Islamic Kaaba in Mecca. Um, and so there's about 14 of these poems and they represent the aesthetic pinnacle uh, of um, pre-Islamic poetic achievement. Um, and Antara's is numbered as, as one of those. And it, <clears throat> his poem, uh, the one I translated as Did Poetry Die, is listed in every single uh, 
version of, of, of this collection. Could you give us a taste of it? Yes. So the poem begins. Hal ghadara shu'ara'u min mutaraddami am hal arafta dara ba'da tawahumi a'yaka rasmu dari a'yaka rasmu dari lam yatakallami hatta takallama kal asam al-a'jami وَلَقَدْ حَبَسْتُ بِهَا طَاوِيلَ نَاقَتِي أَشْكُو إِلَى سُفْعٍ رَوَاكِدَ جُثَمِي So that's the opening uh, of the, the, the poem. You did that uh, without reference to anything. I'm very impressed. Uh, yeah, I need to remember how I translated it. I, know, I can you're, you're remember re- the Arabic, yeah, but I can't remember the, Arabic, the English. You're struggling for the English, but yes. still, we're waiting. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. so I translated this as, Did poetry die? In its war with the poets, is this where Abla walked? Think. The ruins were deaf, refused to reply, then shouted out in a foreign tongue. My camel tried to withdraw. I couldn't move, ranting at the charred stones. So that's how the poem begins. And that's what Mali said about starting yes. off with ruins. Yes. Abla is mentioned. Uh, Mali, can you tell us the part that Abla played in Antara's poetry and life? Okay, well, I think what one of the interesting things about the Mu'alaka, about this poem, Did Poetry Die, is that um, the poetic persona never disengages with the beloved. So Abla keeps returning in the poem, and, and she isn't left behind. Also, when she's first described in the poem, maybe I'll read a line here, um, دارن لی آنستن غدیدن طرفها تو عل عناقی لذیذ تل متبسمی. It's quite um, remarkable that she's evoked through three of the senses. So I think you translated it as um, she has doe eyes and a sweet smile and a soft neck. Or something like that. <laughs> That's what I read. He's looking up. He's looking at Yeah, I, I don't know if I have them in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, can we talk a bit more about Abla? She was his cousin. He fell in love with her. And let's go on from there. So in the poetry, yeah, I think it's remarkable that he keeps returning to her because lots of other poets have many beloveds or they just um, dismiss them. In the legend, I think she plays a lot of interesting roles One thing that I find intriguing is that she herself utters uh, laments. So almost in sort of women stereotypically composed laments in pre-Islamic Arabia. And um, at one point in the legend, she's under the impression that Antara has died. And so, you know, she utters poetry mourning him. And another thing that interests me is that she has an association with the color white and it contrasts with his blackness and it comes up again and again in the poetry and in the prose and I think at at a certain point and at least one version of the legend they kind of switch places and he's been wounded and he rides in her howdudge in her litter and she gets in his armor and mounts his horse. And she's recognized by their enemies as someone who doesn't have the demeanor of a man. And she lifts her helmet and the whiteness of her face is what identifies her as as Abla, as opposed to Antara. So I find it interesting that in this epic that celebrates a black hero, that also the the contrast between black and white is repeatedly evoked and appreciated. It's thought to be very particularly beautiful, isn't it? Really, in many in many contexts. Yeah. Um, Harry, Harry Munt, um Now let's go back to this war, which was the, one of the big things about him. He he he's been described as a poet of war and honor. Uh, what were these wars like? You've said there are a few hundred involved. That's enough to sort of scare the living daylights out of most of us, but. Uh, when they they dawn raid, 
at sort of midday it was all over and the bodies scattered or they did they take hostages did they go for ransom what's going on so I, I mean, I suspect given the temperature, a lot of dawn raiding is uh, is important to success. Um, there's uh, there's hostage taking. I mean, obviously people are people are dying as well. Um, there's I suppose the warfare can be on slightly different scales. So some of the wars that we're told about were reasonably brief. They they just involved a, a little bit of raiding uh, over a short time period. But some of the wars we're told about are said to have gone on for. You know, many years, perhaps even decades. So the war that uh, Antara is famously associated with, called the War of Derhis and Al Khabra, um, is said to have gone on for decades. I think so. In that sense, these were these were sort of back and forth conflicts that could go on for a very long time. And when you won, what did you win? Well, I suppose one of the things you won was tribal honour, and that's the thing that uh, that they were very interested in celebrating through the poetry. Um, obviously, there was. Uh, um, captives to be taken and therefore money to be made from ransoming them back as well and uh, strategic position and um, so lots of um, lots of wars are of course ultimately over the leadership of the tribe and or, or, the, or the wider confederation which which subunit has control over the wider confederation and the access to the power that that brings James Montgomery we've in the, the notes that I've read and in the, there's a great deal about the, the importance of time Yes, and obviously, not obviously, because of a warrior, the importance of death. Yes, could you open those up for us in 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 regard to this particular man and epoch? Mm. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the cosmos that the pre-Islamic poets and Antara in particular uh, thought themselves as inhabiting is particularly stark. So, effectively, you have man, the individual possibly also uh, his family, the tribal unit, the clan associated with him. And you as that unit are pitted against this uh, overwhelming force that they identified as time or fate might be a better uh, way of describing it. Um, And fate would um, bring about at some point in the course uh, of a hero or a warrior's life some form of disintegration, disunity, disruption to that unit, be it the person or be it the the extended um, person in the form of the tribe or the family. Um, And uh, so they saw themselves uh, effectively as pitted against this this, this, um, uh, anonymous force of fate uh, that would somehow, at some point in the course of anyone's life, bring about a disintegration of everything that you felt was important. Did, 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 the, did the way that... Did fate operate through chance? Was chance a big factor? Yes. Uh, well, how, how the individual responded to fate was to see life as effectively determined by chance. So fate was going to happen ineluctably anyway. It was going to bring about disruption at some point to you. Um, But how you responded to it as a poet or or as a warrior was to see that the universal, that the the human universe as opposed to the cosmic one was dominated by chance. And so um, you have the popularity uh, of a sort of uh, uh, a game of gambling, which was known as Miser. uh, And that was where uh, a camel was taken, was slaughtered, uh, and uh, headless and fleshless arrows were thrown and drawn. Uh, and whoever pulled the arrow got the biggest slice of meat. So that sort of game of chance sums up how the poet saw um, his relationship uh, to, to to time. But the way in which you really, really completely took on time was on the battlefield, I think. Because that is where you chanced everything. You chance your life, you chance your 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 horse, your prized possession, you chance the vulnerability of your family back home. If you're defeated, then that tribe can carry on and raid your own tribe in return. And if all the warriors are out uh, and defeated, there's you've lost you've lost everything. And so chance becomes the sort of crucible in which you protect and preserve your honor against the depredations of time. So a human honor uh, had to be preserved against the attack of and time. Andrew, oh, very yes. sorry. And sure. Andrew was regarded as an outstanding warrior yes. in, in the legends anyway, yes. which, which can, you can t- track back, you think, to the 6th century? Uh, he certainly... Um, I, 
I'm happy to believe that he won his freedom on the battlefield, which is no mean feat um, through uh, recognition by his father for his valour one day in single-handedly saving the tribe from attack. Um, so if you have a group of anything from 20 to 100 raiders attacking and, and, and you are the uh, one last person that's preventing that attack from taking place, you have to be pretty skillful, I would expect. Um, yes. Marnie, um, you mentioned... Uh, Abla's lamentations the, and can you because women did have their place in poetry in the, the making of poetry could you just develop that please yes okay so women are associated especially with elegy for the dead there's evidence that they composed in many other genres as well so they um, composed invectives they composed praise poetry but the poems that were preserved for posterity are mainly elegies. But within these poems, I mean, in some ways, they're like the Qasida, because just as the Qasida contains different themes and genres within it, the woman's elegy also contains different genres and themes. So, so you find, for example, in the Hamasat anthologies, from roughly the 10th through the 12th centuries, you find women's elegies are extracted in those anthologies, but they're they're put in different genres. So you'll find some verses by al Khansa in the praise chapter. You know, you find love poetry and all manner of themes and genres. Yes, yeah, so women are especially associated with with elegy for the dead or lamentation, but um, they we do believe that they composed in many other genres as well. Were these poems by women taken in any way seriously as the poems attributed to men? Yes, especially the poet Al Khansa, who was a muhadrama, so her life spanned the pre Islamic and the Islamic eras, but she was regarded very highly, and um, in medieval times there were something like 13 commentaries on her diwan or her corpus circulating. James? Just to pick up on <clears throat> on that point that um, Marley was making, it's one thing to die a noble death on the battlefield. That death only really has meaning if there's someone to actually sing. It's uh, celebrated in song. Uh, and a lot of the elegies that Marley has been referring to that have survived are in fact uh, uh, poems by women for lost uh, loved ones on the battlefield that are there to perpetuate the memory of those who have died and therefore continue this sense of honour uh, in the face of time. Harry, Harry Munt, can you tell us when Antara's works came to be celebrated and why do you think it happened when it did? So... Um, so also after his lifetime moving into the uh, now into the Islamic period and we start to see uh, traces of, of evidence that Antara's poetry was being celebrated maybe a couple of hundred years after his death uh, late 8th, early 9th century Was there any resistance in the Islamic period to poetry from a pre-Islamic period? Um, the Quran has a famous polemical verse about poets and the, uh, their false boasting. Um, so in that sense, yes, there Can was... Can more of that? What did the Quran say? Oh, it talks about poets, that, just very briefly, about poets who move through the valleys uh, talking about things that they don't do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, there is a, uh, there is a sort of backlash against poetry. Um, but uh, that said, uh, pre-Islamic poetry became one of the most you know, popular uh, genres of Arabic literature um, in the centuries uh, after Antara's death. I think partly that's because the same tribal context that Antara was active in himself, of course, didn't disappear with the emergence of Islam and the Arabians who went out and conquered um, outside of the Arabian Peninsula uh, in the 7th century, they also uh, came from these tribal backgrounds and a lot of them from these tribal communities that also sought to continue the, uh, the memorialisation of their, of their deeds on the battlefield through poetry as well. So in that, that may have given the sort of situation in which all these pre-Islamic uh, tribal boasting poetries uh, kept going and of course new poems were being uh, composed as well to commemorate the new feats of these tribes. Um, moving slightly further forward uh, into the second half of the 8th century with the foundation of the new capital at Baghdad, uh, we start to see there an interest in collecting pre-Islamic poetry in Iraq to facilitate uh, other academic 
sciences, basically. So, um, so a lot of philologists, linguists, grammarians, and then Quranic scholars as well start to become interested in Arabic poetry for its uh, for the evidence it provides for the for the language. There's a, there's a famous uh, quote from a from uh, from a from a critic about how uh, if you don't understand something in the Quran, then look at what the poets have to say using that language. So poetry was began began to be seen as an ancillary subject for uh, discipline for helping understand these other areas as well. To come back to Antara, when did he begin? He was in an oral culture, which many of the early poems, we believe that Homer was and so on and so forth, that was what went on. But he could go on and carry on, and it had a substance and had a sort of valid continuity, as people have expressed in this programme over years, and he's in their own books and far better. Um, when did it enter into literature, into writing, at least, if not literature? So we have sources from the early 9th century that uh, provide a bit of biographical detail about Antara and quote some of his poetry at the same time. So a 9th century scholar called Ibn Qutayba, um gives a sort of a bit of the biography that James was mentioning earlier and then he also has some extracts from Antara's verses that he sort of, yeah, this is a particularly good one or there's one where he criticises it, he, Antara went too far in this passage. Mm-hmm. So he, in, you can see evidence there of it starting to be collected together. Um, and then from there it goes forwards. It, it, Antara's poetry keeps <clears throat> coming up in um, in works that are collecting uh, larger uh, l- 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 law from the pre-Islamic about the pre-Islamic periods to go with a lot of the uh, narratives of these battles that were fought went with lots of accompanying poetry Antara will of course have provided some of that as well Um, and then over into the 10th century and then you start to see the collections that survive um, of people bringing his poetry together from the 11th century Uh, James James Montgomery what would have been thought distinctive about Antara's verse Uh, so there's two ways to answer this. First, to pick up on something that Harry was uh, was saying there. Um, the interest in the uh, Baghdad-based um, uh, culture in Antara uh, was that pre-Islamic poetry was seen as a sort of model of um, chivalric and, and heroic virtues. Uh, and this was a society that was very interested in breeding and in lineage and parentage, and Antara broke all the rules. So but he we're was entering into the great period of Arabic uh, civilization are, there on all fronts. Uh, four yeah. or five hundred years of magnificent achievements in, yeah. in, in intellectual um, arts. Yeah. And this sense that Antara was someone who overcame all the odds um, uh, it remains persistent all the way into the epic that Marley was discussing earlier. And I think that has a bearing on the poetry itself. So what's distinctive about it is this voice of absolutely no compromise. There is no compromise in Antara's poetry whatsoever, whether it be the way he positions himself against the rest of the world or against his opponents, or whether it be the way he positions himself against the tradition of the Qasida that Marley was discussing earlier. So that's what's uh, really uh, distinct about him but what I find particularly fascinating about Antara and unique and that I don't see in, in or hear in other pre-Islamic poets is an attention to detail that is um, in the imagery that is quite simply staggering. So here's an example and I'll, <clears throat> I'll give you the Arabic first and uh, so he's describing um, the moment where he leaves his beloved um, and he is remembering the way that her teeth shone and the the, the darkness the the, the 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 fragrance that was coming from her and and is is compares her to uh, a water soaked field of flowers just after a uh, heavy spring rain in the desert and we have this amazing long image a big extended simile in which um the flowers and and everything are described and right at the end you hear this fatara and so I'll just turn briefly to, to, to my translation and explain. So we have this field of flowers, rain-soaked field of flowers, and he, he, he zooms right in on this tiny, tiny detail. He says, and the lone hopper, he's describing an insect, 
and the lone hopper, look, screeches its drunken song, scraping out a tune, leg on leg, like a one-armed man bent over a fire stick. Now, I have pondered that image for the last seven years when I was working on this translation. It still baffles me. But what I think is unique about Antara is this this almost cinematic close-up focus that he zooms in on this detail. And in the middle of all this beauty, you have this sort of grotesque pain also of this fly, which is screeching, it's, it's like a cicada, screeching away. Um, and he compares it to... Uh, a one-armed man bent over a fire stick. I mean, that is, for me, that's just uh, poetry at its best. Marley, Marley Hammond, can you tell us something about the medieval epic of Antar and Abla, how it developed? Okay, well, um, as Harry said, we have reports or akhbar about Antar and his life from the 9th and 10th centuries, and they appeared in um, Ashar Shura, as Harry mentioned, and also in Kitab al aghani of Abu al-Faraj al-Isfahani. And then Peter Heath has kind of a history of the Antara epic in his book, The Thirsty Sword. So he mentions that in the 12th century, we find references to the Sirat Antar. So we don't have versions of it yet in book form, but we have references in books to the fact that it existed. And I think he gives the example of a biographical dictionary of physicians, where one of the physicians was nicknamed Al-Antari because in his spare time he copied uh, the stories or a hadith of Antar al-Absi. So um, then in the 15th century, we start to find manuscripts of the Sira, But I think they're still relatively rare until the 19th century and partly the renewed interest in Sirat Antar in the 19th century had to do with the European discovery of Antara in the early 1800s. So this was, I, it, it seems, sounds rather fragmented and occasional to me, but this was a steady regarded love affair going through the centuries. I think that we don't know as much about the history as we could because the manuscripts aren't there until the 15th century. So we don't really know how it evolved from the time of the Akhbar mentioned in um, Ibn Qutayba and Al-Isfahani and you know, what happened between that stage and the manuscripts that are from the 15th century. One of the things that's very interesting about the early stratum of, of this Antar and Abla love affair is that in the sources that Marley was referring to, Abla doesn't play a role at all. And yet by the 15th century, this great epic love story, this romance, uh, erupts. Harry, um uh, Arabic began to be spoken more and more widely. The civilization was, was enormous for hundreds of years. How did that affect his standing? I think it the spread of Arabic um, and more people starting to use Arabic as a spoken and, and written language meant that... Uh, so on the one hand, it meant that... Um, that Arabs uh, came into contact with other cultures and started to think seriously about what it was that distinguished Arabic culture um, and made it um, particularly uh, important. And poetry was the thing they, they sort of picked on most heavily. There's a, a famous saying that poetry is the diwan of the Arabs. It's the, it's the archive of the Arabs and the records of their activities and, and, why, and, their, and their cultural success. And so and Antara's uh, deeds and renown and his poetry played an important part in that. It also, of course, meant that, um, that just different regions of the of the world started to started to use the arabic language and to um and to get interested in this in in the history of a culture that sort of got, they had to trace back to back to arabia and pre-islamic arabia and it's quite interesting in some ways and maybe remarkable that uh, that the survive the earliest surviving uh, collections of antara's poetry come from al-andalus um from the 11th century um, which was a time of sort of remarkable interest there in uh, pre-Islamic Arabian history and poetry and literature. So Antara's, uh, the collection of Antara's poetry fitted alongside that activity and his renown spread in that sense with the Arabic, with Arabic language and literature. How does he compare with other pre-Islamic poem, poets, James? So the thing that is uh, remarkable and unique about Antara's uh, poetry, uh, in addition to this um, uh, 
obsession with, with, with the small detail. If we compare him with perhaps the most famous pre-Islamic poet of all, a man called Imbro al Qais, who was from uh, slightly f- uh, much further south in, in Arabia, um, he his poetry is uh, inflected with uh, Himyarite, uh, as Harry was mentioning earlier, the South Arabian kingdom of Himyar, of Himyarite notions of kingship. In fact, he is thought to have lost uh, the throne um, when his father was killed and he spent the rest uh, of his life wandering around Arabia as far as Constantinople trying to regain his throne. So his is a much more regal and less um, uh, uh, everyday type of poetry, just to give you one example. All right, why do you think his legacy uh, has endured for so long? I think it's partly because of all the uh, all the unique aspects of his poetry that James uh, has been talking about, and the uh, the way that he was able to be a to be a model for a particular kind of uh, warrior and uh, and courageous and also generous uh, mm-hmm. um, person and and a tribesman as well. Um, it's also, uh, of course, partly the response of much wider historical phenomenon, such as the creation of an empire by Arabian tribesmen from the desert that could take that, that could take his poetry and the uh, and those ideas with them throughout the uh, throughout the lands that they that they conquered and established new, new societies in as well is there any way finally Marley of assessing what his reputation is now he's still a very popular figure that informs popular culture there have been films made about him and television serials he's a very exciting figure and he still has his appeal today and you would endorse that, James? I uh, yes, very much so. He's the classic figure of the underdog who succeeds against all the odds. And that is as relevant today as it was 1,500 years ago. Well, thank you very much, James Montgomery, Marnie Hammond and Harry Munt. Next week, it's William Cecil, Lord Burley, the most powerful man at the court of Elizabeth I. Thank you very much for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I wanted to ask James about his um, his translation of the first line of the Mu'allaqa, Did Poetry Die? Because it's a very bold translation and um, he interprets the line differently than it has been interpreted for hundreds, if not, mm, yeah. <laughs> if not thousands of years. Yeah. So the line is normally translated something uh, like this and I, I'll need to... Uh, remind myself of... I love the way you look up the English but spout up the Arabic without uh, a problem. <laughs> After seven years of uh, uh, reading I've, I've been reading this this, this poem by uh, Antara for 30 years plus. It's the poem that I go back to time and time again and it sort of uh, lives uh, w- with me on a, a regular basis, uh, unlike my English. It normally means uh, d- have the poets left any piece of poetry unpatched in other words, in, all, in view of all the decades and all the number of poems that have been composed, is there anything that I could possibly say that hasn't been said before? Uh, and that interpretation, which is a very valid one, um, concentrates on the most difficult word in the line, which we, only occurs in this poem. It doesn't occur anywhere else. When I was translating it, I focused on all of the words that I could know and that I did know and that are common in the rest of the corpus. And so the key word there is the second word, ghadara, which means to leave someone dead and unburied on the battlefield. And so on that basis, uh, I went from have the poets left poetry unburied on the battlefield. And I thought, this is a war poet. I'm hearing him as a war poet. I'm understanding this whole poem as a poem about war. It's a response to the challenge that the two brothers of the father that Andara has just killed have issued. Uh, And so uh, rather than focus on this more uh, image that is more concerned with poetic creativity, I focused on the battle context. Uh, But in order to really explain it, the narrative context here, I think, is that Andara has just been on a raid. There's just been a battle. And he's on his way home and he comes across these traces and he said, the the battle was so awful, did poetry itself die in the melee, in the carnage? And so he's trying to resurrect, revivify poetry 
uh, in the course of the next 85 lines. And that was why I plumbed for the translation that I did. Well, I just think it's, um, I mean, the first time I read the translation, I thought, well, that's very different from what I <laughs> normally think the line means. What do you normally so, think the line means? Well, like he, like he quoted before. Um, so there's this word, mutaraddami, hmm. and um, it means, well, apparently it only means this because of the way Antara's poem is interpreted. Yeah. But um, people usually take it uh, to mean a, a tear or yeah, a... Yeah, or sort of pat, unpatched or, or something like that, right? Or patched right. up, rather, patched up. So people have interpreted the line to mean something like have the poets left anything unsung? I, I think I'm probably hmm. quoting a translation there, not accidentally. <laughs> Do you have yeah. a comment on this? No, I'm happy to let these uh, the experts <laughs> of poetry <laughs> <laughs> argue it out. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to have said that you didn't? You know, one thing we didn't cover too much is you were mentioning, uh, someone was mentioning, I think, Marley, the, uh, the sort of the European discovery of Antara in the mm. 19th century yeah, that's as well. A good subject. And that seemed, yeah. I think, quite an interesting. I mean, again, that, 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 that he as a character was picked up in the, in the mm. 19th century in European circles as well, of, of the many characters available from this, this mm. period as well. Seemed like it seemed a sort of interesting, interesting topic. Uh, European visitors to uh, Cairo hear this epic being recited in the cafes this epic of Antar and Abla. Uh, and because they are uh, po possibly looking for the origins of Homer or whatever, they get very excited about the presence of this ancient epic. And the uh, interest in it sort of stems uh, from this misguided notion that somehow this could uh, uh, help explain the emergence of the Homeric epics. I'm very interested in the, in the epic as a kind of counter-narrative. Antara was black and is celebrating himself as being that. And also in the um, in the epic, his his mother is described as being very beautiful. And so I I don't know. I kind of think of it as like a black panther of its day. It's celebrating blackness in a way that's refreshing. Is there any comment about his blackness other than the fact that he is black? Well, it is the source of of injustice. I mean, he has lines, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in the position to quote them, but, um, but he has lines where he talks about how people mistreat him and abuse him because he's black. So yeah, I, I do sort of read it as a counter narrative in that sense. In, in the one poem, which is one of his most quoted poems that, that Marley is, is, is referring to, he says, um, one half of me is from the best of the tribe, it's from the aristocrats of the tribe. The other half, which is descended from the sons of Ham, one of the, the um, uh, sons of Noah, thought to be the ancestor of the, 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 the black people, I defend with my sword. This defiance, um, we're reading back into the poetry, but uh, this defiance seems to uh, then create his, one of his most enduring and popular lines, uh, and um, comes to be the cornerstone of this enormous narrative that's constructed. What, what's on the most basis. enduring? And one half of me is the best of the tribe. The other half I defend with my sword. I, I assume under a situation um, of having, was, I think his mother was Ethiopian, or an Ethiopian slave, something like that. I assume that's not that wasn't unique, and that there would have been there would have been other uh, there were other people around. I mean, say Ethiopia actually is quite closely connected culturally mm. with the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula, and so that would have that 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 could have you know, created links across uh, across the Red Sea between Arabia and Africa as well, and there there would have been people from the empires to the north as well in Arabia, as well. There would have been other people around. The kingdom of Aksum, which is the kingdom that Harry is alluding to from uh, Eritrea and, and, and Ethiopia, had very, very close ties with the South Arabian kingdom of Himyar. And there's significant interference from the side of Aksum in the affairs of Himyar, uh, together with military occupation and so on, in the half century or so running up to when we think Antara was alive. And so there would have been naturally... Eritreans, Ethiopians uh, in modern parlance uh, present in the peninsula. Well, thank you very much for attempting to disentangle legend from his here's the producer who's going to offer you something Just wonderful. Just ask you to your coffee. Tea, please. Tea. Oh. 
Uh, tea, please. Two cheese, Melvin. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Did you know that technology can make us kinder to one another? Did you hear about the diver who walked out of the sea onto a Portuguese beach, dragging the internet behind him? Did you realize that how you speak to the little robot helper in your house might cement age-old stereotypes for decades to come? I'm Alex Kratoski, and those are just some of the stories that we've looked at in The Digital Human, the podcast that explores what it means to be human in the digital age. If you want to hear more, and I guarantee we will surprise you, come check us out exclusively on BBC Sounds.